Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. The main talking points on tonight's programme. Brendan Rodgers wants to make the gap even bigger between Celtic and the rest of the Premiership. Scotland's under-17s defeat the Faroe Islands in their opening European Championship. And the helicopter is ready for takeoff once more as our Broth and Forfer battle it out for the League 2 trophy at the weekend. Yeah, just a few of the points we'll be discussing on the programme tonight. Alan Ruff, as ever, is alongside me, Peter Martin. I'm delighted to see our boot room guest is Edinburgh City striker Craig Beatty. And Edinburgh, with a, a difficult start to the season, have suddenly rallied and they will remain in League Two, which I think is a tremendous feat. Uh, congratulations to all the players. We're going to talk to Craig about that and the season uh, that he and his fellow teammates have had. Um, but let's cut to the chase. Uh, Celtic were uh, speaking today, Brendan Rodgers in particular, and he was talking about um, a number of things that I, I think occupy the back pages as well. Uh, we'll get his thoughts shortly. Here's the record. Uh, first of all, um, Celtic pals got me through my Ibrox racist hell. This is, of course, Scott Sinclair um, with the fan uh, who allegedly uh, made uh, gestures towards him, and I think he's being dealt with, and rightly so. Um, the Sun, I won't rush back for a medal. This is, of course, uh, Musa Dembele on that hamstring. Uh, will he be available for the cup final? Uh, the odds are shortening, let me tell you. And the uh, Daily Mail... Uh, it's all about that man, treble yell, Cristiano Ronaldo with a hat-trick to sink Atletico Madrid in the Champions League at semi-final first leg at the Bernabeu. Uh, we will talk about that, but uh, first to Brendan Rodgers, who's been discussing some of those uh, back-page headlines. But the, the first point he was asked was about this gap, um, and the ominous answer is that he wants it to get even bigger. When I first came in here, I think it was deemed that maybe the season was going to be a very, very close season. I think everyone looked at the semi-final result last year and Rangers coming up and Aberdeen were right in the race and obviously maybe fell away a bit towards the end. But it's not something that's happened by accident. You know, the gap has been created by the players. The gap has been created by their performance. I don't tend to think about it or worry about it. I only worry about Celtic. You know, to take this club forward to improve performance level of the team. And if that creates a gap, so be it. My aim is to make the gap even bigger next season, you know, get in, you know, a few more players of quality that can really help the group again push on to the next level and uh, and that will be the case then. Well, Craig, you know him, you worked under him. <coughs> um, I think for the other clubs who are ready to chase, um, it's rather ominous words from the Celtic manager. Yeah, absolutely. Um, having watched that, I think the first thing that I picked up on was that I think Brendan's actually doing himself a disservice there. Um, you know, as modest as he is, he's heaping all the praise onto the players, uh, but make no mistake about it, he's the one that's driving the players to create that gap. And, and knowing the way he works, knowing his personality and the way that, that Brendan is, he wants to break every single record possible and win every tournament that his, that his club's entered. Yeah, but you get a feeling that he'll be driving them on for this unbeaten record as well. Um, I, th I don't think it will be getting sort of mentioned as such. They won't be going in the changing room every day and talking about it. But you know, underline that the, the players will know that there's that hunger and that desire there. And I think we'll start to see how serious he is. Whether he starts to breed some of the, the younger players into the team, or whether he really goes for for the, for the total shot of, of being unbeaten and you know securing the treble. We're going to hear from some of the uh, Player of the Year nominations, including of course Scott Sinclair uh, and uh, we'll also hear from Aberdeen's Johnny Hayes as well, just a, a couple of the players involved in the PFA nominations, but uh, Brendan Rodgers was talking about one that wasn't uh, named uh, and that was his captain. I still can't get away from how Scott Brown's not on it. <laughs> I really can't. Uh, I don't know what he was like in other years, but for this season, and my first season up here in, in Scotland, the level that this man has played at, I said it a few weeks ago, I think he's the, the most influential player in Scottish football. I look at Kante down south as a centre midfield player, and uh, I think he got the, the Player of the Year award down there. Um, and I certainly think that Scott Brown um, uh, is certainly at least worthy of being a nominee. 
Do you agree with them, Ruffy? Well, this is what I was telling you uh, about when the voting slips come in. You know, sometimes there can be uh, not not uh, not rigging or anything like that. Just players expressing votes of who they're voting for and who they're not voting for. Scott Brown has had an absolutely fantastic season, but I think if you were to have a poll uh, between all the players in the SPL, not not them all, but he wouldn't win the most liked person. Yeah. Just for his football and ability, not nothing for nothing else. He's the kind of player at a football team where other players would uh, feel not hundred percent to vote for him. Not everybody, obviously. Yeah. If you're going to if you're going to vote for him in his football and ability, you tick the box. But unfortunately, he's the kind of player that upsets everybody else, and that would take votes away from him. Okay, Craig, you're still playing football. Do you not vote for a player because you don't like him? Um, to be honest, I think. It's turned into a little bit of a popularity contest. Um, you know, the, the public we sit and watch Scott on the telly, and he looks very, very arrogant. He looks aggressive. Um, he looks like he's not a, a nice person. And on the contrary, he's actually a really, really nice guy. In fact, he's a gentleman. He's a, he's a lovely fella. Um, but what he does is he creates a persona and an image on the pitch. So when players are, as they say, marking their votes up, they're, they're going to think, "Am I going to vote for this? This lad who's been in my face. He's been growling. He's been snarling." They're not. So. Unfortunately for Scott, he's, he's not made it into the nominations, but he'll still have a, you know, a, a bit of satisfaction from the, the praise that Brendan's put on him and, and he'll know what he's contributed to the team this year. I, I would like to think he'd be nominated for the sports writers and the four for the sports writers. I think the sport right, sports writers are a different kettle of fish. You know, they'll appreciate you know, and judge him on his football and ability and what he's done this year. OK, uh, we'll wait to find that out, Robbie, to see if there's any substance to it. Uh, once Scott has made it on to uh, the uh, nominees for Player of the Year, that's Scott Sinclair. Um, of course, over the last couple of days, he's uh, suffered from uh, racist abuse, not only at a football match, but on social media as well, which uh, at times can be a platform for the, the great unhinged. Um, this is what the Celtic manager had to say about it. I think the work, there's been so much great work done over the last 20 years uh, in Britain as a whole uh, to wipe out this sort of thing. You know, it's something in this day and age now that when you do hear about it, it's very, very surprising. Um, so thankfully it's been dealt with straight away, uh, which is good to see and, uh, and uh, we hope we don't have any more incidents like it for players like Scotty and, and whoever else. I don't think any fans should be allowed back in, whether it's Rangers or any other club. I think they should stamp it out if you're, if you are caught, especially um, in this day and age, um, involved in any kind of racist abuse. I don't think you should be allowed back in the ground, especially mm -hmm. if you're in that ground. Yep, I, th I think uh, the most important thing is that these uh, people are seen to be punished, and you're right, punished severely. Uh, we have to use it as a deterrent. Uh, I don't know exactly what that would be, but it has to send a message out to everybody else, but this is not acceptable, uh, particularly up here in Scotland. And uh, I mean, you're saying forever, you know, maybe five years, something like that, you know, but uh, it has to be seen for everybody else that this, this, this is not acceptable. Yeah, two things I'd like to see, a ban and then a, an education programme for the person who's guilty of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, considering it's, it's 2017, it's... It's something that um, we're used to seeing in sort of Eastern European football and, and the sort of culture over there. Um, and it's, it's disgusting, it's deplorable, it, ha it has to be stamped out. Yeah, um, uh, just as far as uh, the nominees are concerned, just in case you missed out on yesterday's PFA nominees, here are the uh, four uh, involved <coughs> in it. Stuart Armstrong, Moussa Dembele, Scott Sinclair's in there and Johnny Hayes as well. What do you make of uh, the four players nominated, Craig? They've all had fantastic seasons. I think, you know, Scott um, and Moussa, have, they've combined well together all season. Johnny Hayes has been terrific up at Aberdeen and, and we all know what they've achieved this season. Um, I think it's, it's probably fair. Yeah, OK. Uh, you can give us your view on it. Who do you think should win the uh, Player of the Year? At Peter and Ruffy on Twitter and Facebook.com forward slash Peter and Ruffy. Give us your view on uh, maybe one player that's missing or indeed who you think is going to be standing up on the platform with the trophy on Sunday night at that gala award ceremony at the Hilton in Glasgow. Um, OK, coming up after the break, we'll hear from one of the other nominees who doesn't wear the green and white hoops. 
Uh, that's uh, Johnny Hayes, a man who decided to put pen to paper and stay with Aberdeen. Great credit to uh, Derek McInnes for keeping him in the Granite City. Uh, we'll hear from him and we'll uh, discuss his point that maybe Aberdeen need £20 million to challenge Celtic. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. Uh, and uh, because we're in the early stages of the programme, we always like to say a big hello to our new viewers in Aberdeen, Dundee and Ayr, as well as our existing team from Edinburgh and Glasgow. Great to have you on board. Um, Aberdeen is where we focus our attention because in the nominees for PFA Scotland Player of the Year is one Johnny Hayes. Uh, and of course, um, he's been a star for Derek McInnes' side this season. Quite a lot of people uh, realise he's got a trick or two in his locker. Um, and I think it was great that he managed to yeah. sign him on again. I thought he was maybe off, Ruffy. Yeah, I think they identified that he's a big, big player for Aberdeen. Uh, it was really noticeable when he was out of the team. Aberdeen struggled a wee bit because he gives them pace, scores a spectacular goal from now and then. And uh, I, I just think he's had... A fantastic season and I can see why he's up there and I said yesterday I was pleased that the, the players did vote him in because it, it gives everybody in Aberdeen you know that we're thinking about them you know yeah. Aberdeen get I think a lot of time get sort of left out for a lot of things like this but I think now I think everybody's realising now for the last couple of seasons that Aberdeen have been a force and uh, the players should get nominated. It's very much a team effort under Derek McInnes <clears throat> but you do need special players to do things uh, Craig. Yeah absolutely and that's what he's added to that to that squad he's done fantastic from his went there and uh, you know with, with Hayes and Adam Rooney up front he's got some real good players there um, Boy Muirhead as well who's had a really good season um, so he's, he's, he's done great for them and to, to have the sort of pace and um, outlet that, that um, Johnny has is um, so really, really good work yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, if Aberdeen are to progress, Johnny Hayes himself uh, has admitted they need to try and improve on the European stage. Last season in Europe was the first season where we were really, really disappointed to go out. Um, thought we had a better team over two legs against Maribor. Probably should have put the tie to bed in the first leg, let alone the second one. Um, and we look back at that as, as a big regret because we, we deserve to go through over two legs. We're, we're the better side and it never worked out. We, we always seem to get a bit of a bad draw in Europe. We've had some tough ties over the last few years, but I thought if it had gone on uh, strength of teams last season, was probably the, the easiest chance we've had of, of making progress into that fourth round. And uh, obviously we need a bit of luck in the draw again this year, but we'll be keen, keen to, to improve on last year. Well, I think that's something that I think a number of clubs out with Celtic um, will need to do, Ruffy, if our coefficient is to rise. We need someone to try and get to the group stages of a competition. Yeah, and if you were sitting here, you would say Aberdeen would be that team. You know, they've been knocking on the door uh, for two or three seasons. They're just failing at uh, the last hurdle. Uh, and, and the more experience they would get in the group in the Europa, I think year on year, they would get better and better. So I think if we're looking at any team, it would be Aberdeen. Uh, I noticed Johnny Hayes has mentioned some of the papers that uh, if Aberdeen are to close the gap on Celtic, um, they'd need about £20 million worth uh, of investment. I think that's a conservative estimate on it, Craig. Uh, I wouldn't like to see them chase that, though. I think they've got the right structure and Scottish clubs have got that structure where they're not going to overspend. Yeah, I think part of the reason for that is that they won't catch Celtic. Um, Celtic are going to strengthen again. Uh, we've heard Brendan say that, and you know, to that thought's quite frightening, to be perfectly honest. And throwing money's not not the way forward. Um, Rangers won't do it, and, and Aberdeen certainly won't throw twenty million to try and bridge the gap. What they should try and do is, is consolidate that that second spot. And I think uh, the way Rangers have been recently, there's there's a good chance that they could do that. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a players out there uh, mm -hmm. that I think you can. Um, you can actually snatch who who might do your right turn. I mean, if I was mm -hmm. if I was an Aberdeen <clears throat> boss or a, a Rangers boss, I'd be looking at the likes of Liam Boyce. I mean, there's a guy scoring goals mm -hmm. for fun at Ross County. I mean, the county fans won't be happy that we're trying to shift somebody on, but he, he's bound to have caught mm -hmm. the eye. Yeah, I think uh, the big question next year, as far as Aberdeen and Rangers are concerned, is who's working with what budget. 
you know, and uh, who, that determines what players <coughs> you can bring in, obviously, to add to the wages as well. So uh, I think Derek has got a lot of contacts. Uh, I'm sure the new Rangers manager will have contacts as well. And I, I think every, I keep saying this, everybody's waiting on that first Rangers player. The supporters are waiting on that first. Where is he coming from? How much is he going to be? Is he going to be a loan player? Is he going to be a permanent player? Uh, and that's the kind of things that supporters will be looking at. And that'll be the same at Aberdeen as well. Everybody will be looking at what Aberdeen players are going to come in to strengthen the pool. Because obviously Derek's been trying to do that for a long, long time. Yep, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do. And of course, let's not forget uh, Hearts. There's going to be, uh, you know, midway through, well, in fact, I think September, October, the Hearts fans will be in a superb stadium with a brand new main stand, uh, 20,000 capacity uh, and a chance to really hopefully uh, put a team on the park. But big questions are asked at your old side about Ian Cathro and what type of team he's going to build from his summer recruits, Craig. Yeah, absolutely. He's got a job in his hands. Uh, you know, uh, the jury's out, so to speak. Um, he's he's had a bit of a... He's been up and down to start. Um, I know recently he was, he's sort of putting on a, a display for the fans to try and show them to be patient in what they're actually trying to achieve. Craig Levine's working away in the background there with, with Ian and his backroom staff. Um, but he's got a really difficult project on there because, make no mistake, the Hearts fans are very, very demanding. They want results, they want success. And they believe that they should be right up there challenging alongside the likes of Aberdeen and, and progressing beyond that. Yeah, well, and talking of Hearts fans, earlier today I caught up with uh, Alan Young, a uh, Hearts fan, to see what he thought of uh, the season as it uh, heads uh, out, just trying to hold on to to fifth might be uh, the main aim for, for Hearts, never mind talking about Europe. Yeah, I, I think I think we're looking at maintaining fifth. I think that's as good as we're going to get this season now. Are you an angry Hearts fan? Are you disappointed, disillusioned, or just thinking... Let the manager get his own buys in in the summer. For the last few weeks of the season, I think apathetic is probably the best word for me. I think it's just we just need the season done, need to move on. Yeah, and as far as the remaining games, I mean, it doesn't get any easier. You always know in the top six you're going to get tough games, but where do you think the points are going to come from? I'm looking at Aberdeen, Rangers, St Johnston, Celtic to finish now after that disappointing 2 2 draw with 10 man Partick Thistle. I think if we get a point against St Johnson and we may pick up a point, perhaps all three at Ibrox, that's about as good as we can expect, I think, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, listen, by the time you get to September, you could have, you know, one of the best stadiums in the country, the, the, the main stand, uh, hopefully it will be finished, 20,000 capacity, um, but I think all the fans just want a team fit for the park and fit for the fans to cram into. Yeah, I absolutely. If... If it's not there, if the product's not there to watch on the park, there is going to come a time when they're going to stop going. It's simple as that. They've got a lot of positives from the board. Um, I mean, as far as the manager's concerned, do, do you think he has to hit the ground running? There's suggestions, you know, that you know by October, September, people will be making their judgments on his team, the position in the league and whether the manager can cut it or not. Do you think it'll well, be that early? Yeah, I think there's no doubt. I think maybe he might, if he's not got them firing on all cylinders by after the first round of games in the, in the Premiership, then, yeah, I think he's... I lost you for a minute there. Just at the crucial point where I thought you were going to say if he's not cutting it, his tease out by September, October. That's exactly what I did say. <laughs> I had a sneaky feeling that's what you were saying. Trust, trust Skype just to cut you at the perfect moment there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, well, well listen, uh, let's take a look at the immediate situation. Um, Hearts against Aberdeen, give us your prediction. Uh, if I was a betting man, I'd probably say 2 nothing Aberdeen. Wow. <laughs> you're... And that's, it's hard for me to say that because Aberdeen don't have a great record at Tynecastle, but I can just see it. We're not doing too well, Ruffy, <laughs> with uh, fa fans who should be positive. I mean, the Inverness fan, he, he was right up there as a man who yeah. just didn't have any optimism whatsoever. But Alan's fairly <laughs> pragmatic about the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, that's what supporters are like. They want to see a win inside. Uh, I mean, Harps uh, were sitting second top of the league and sitting comfortably there. And, and they went down uh, in a horrible path uh, since the new coaches went in there. So what has happened is that 
He's now put himself under pressure for, for the beginning of the season, unless he does something in the next four games uh, to get the supporters back on board, because that's just one guy, you know, as his view there, but there'll be others, you know, and I think I think the stadium as well is going to put bigger pressure on him because there's going to be a 20,000 stadium, you know, and, and supporters will want a team to go with that stadium. Yeah, and they'll want them challenging, Craig. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the fan you touched on it, saying that the, if they've not got the players and they're not going to watch the quality, then the stadium will be half empty. But having been there, having known what the fans are like, if you, do, if you do get quality in there and you get results, the place is it's an amazing place to play football and the fans will really get behind them. But touching on that, the top six, you know, this is a little bit pessimistic, but it's about pennies rather than points at this stage in the season. And I think there's a little bit of an attitude where once you get the top six, you play against Rangers, Celtic, Aberdeen, and you're gathering extra gate, extra income, as opposed to maybe winning games if you don't quite get the top six. Yeah. Um, OK, if you become used to our new uh, longer programme now, we have a, a little break here um, and we'll get a bit of news in there and then we'll be right back with you for the second part of the show. Thanks for joining us once again on Peter and Ruffy's Football Show after that uh, short break on STV2. Uh, we're back for the second half of the programme and thankfully the fitness of one of our uh, main pundits is beyond question. Um, so, uh, Alan Ruff is here with me, <laughs> Peter Martin and Craig Beattie, looking felt like and as if he can still do a job uh, for Edinburgh City. Uh, well, you can do a job because you guys are staying in League Two and I think it's a, a tremendous achievement. Do you know what? I'm, absol <clears throat> I'm absolutely buzzing. Um, what, what this group of lads at Edinburgh City have achieved this year is phenomenal. Um, I've been telling people all season that we're, we're a decent side, you know, even when we weren't getting results, you know, I've, Got a couple of stats for you. On 29th October, we had four points, 11 games, 32% of the season we'll get four points. We were the whipping boys of, of League Two, um, 17 games before we'd actually won a match. Um, and then we've gone and get ourselves safe with, with two games to spare. It's, it's, it's remarkable. And for a, a group of lads that have got no football league experience, no professional experience, you know, they're, they're virtually a squad of amateurs that, that are gaffering the board of took into the league. and. It's, it really is remarkable what we've achieved this year and, and I can't praise the club highly enough. Yeah, you, you don't need to tell us about those stats. I mean, yeah. week in, week out, yeah. Ruffy, on the Saturday, <laughs> we were just <laughs> praying for you to somehow yeah. get a result. Yeah, and we had to start taking you out of your fixed odds, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, <laughs> we started winning games. But no, it is. I mean, we, sat, we did. We sat here every Saturday because uh, you don't want to see a, a team coming into the division and then going back out again about all the hard work that goes into it. So, yeah, that survival was obviously the name of the game and it looked as if the players were getting more and more experience, you know, as the, as the season was going on. And uh, it didn't take them that long, you know. I mean, for the whole, I would say, the half of the season, you have been playing well. Yeah, we've been playing great. Um, it took a little while for the penny to drop. You know, the lads were a bit sort of naive at set pieces and stuff initially. Um, but we worked hard on it, you know, a lot of discussions with the players and the, and the management and we managed to get to grips with it. Um, and we've gone there and we've put in performance after performance. You know, attitude's been fantastic the whole way through, and you know the, the manager really believed on us. Um, you know, there's no question Brendan's going to come out this season in Scotland with, with all the plaudits and all the praise. But you know, I would really like for for Gary Jardine here to get to get a lot of praise as well because the, the job he's done has been remarkable. Yeah, what you know, Ruffy's mentioned that the second half of the season he started to put the results together. Was there a significant moment in the timeline where you thought? He's changed something. He said something, or you know, the players suddenly got it. Um, I think I think they suddenly got it. Uh, the, the attitude remained the same. The, the focus, the intensity that we work every week, um, that that all remained the same. Um, and I think it was more about consistency rather than changing anything. You know, a lot of the, the lads have been mainstays in the team. We don't have a huge squad, and and I think it was just a case of perseverance and consistency. And um, you know, we've. We've been rewarded as as players, and, and the club's certainly been rewarded by by standing by everybody. 
Yeah, well, uh, full marks to you and do pass on our congratulations to <coughs> all the guys. To be fair, Ruffy, we didn't actually tip Edinburgh City for the drop. Um, mm. Maka and Gordon Smith tipped Edinburgh City to go straight back down again. And we think we were a... I'm trying to think who we actually... It was Montrose we decided to go mm -hmm. uh, for the drop. Um, so... There you are. At least, we're, at least we haven't yeah. stuck them in, which usually we do with our guests. No, no, no. I think right from the start, <coughs> uh, as soon as we saw that uh, Craig had signed for them, you know, there was only one way they were going to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no need to milk it, Ruffy. I mean. It took me half a season to get fit and then we started climbing the league. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I think what's, what, with the run that we had at the start as well, um, I think that's created a false sense among the other teams. Yeah. I think there was just a perception that we were going to be the whooping boys, we were going to finish bottom, and if Cowdenbeath, Ann and Montrose finished ninth in the league, then, all right, it was a rubbish season, but they weren't at, at risk of going down. And suddenly we started putting our, our results together, our run of results, and then all of a sudden the other teams were, that were a bit complacent now couldn't pick it up. And you've got the likes of Berwick and Clyde and you know, Stirling were down there for a while as well. So it's, you know, it's, been, it's been a great season. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, and, and the downside to that is because some of the players have put in good performances, do you think they'll be cherry-picked? Is there one or two special players? I'd like to think so, because we have got a couple of really, really good players there. The, the Gafford strengthen as well, which, which the board's backed him with that. Guys like um, Matt Laird and Josh Walker, um, who have got a bit of experience, but he's managed to get them on long-term contracts, which, you know, again, credit to the board. Uh, but there, there is some really, really good players there, and we also work with really well as a unit. Yeah, um, you're best placed um, to judge the top end, because there's a real battle going on at the moment between our broth and Forfar. It's obviously a wee bit of needle um, there and I'm sure Dick Campbell would love nothing more <coughs> than to just snatch the title uh, on the last day of the season. So the trophy is going in a helicopter. Where have we heard that before, Ruffy? Um, and our broth travel to Stirling Albion and it's Forfar um, playing host to Annan Athletic. So with your wise head on for League Two... I think home advantage is going to be massive for Forfa. Um, obviously, I both have got a tricky game down at Stirling. Um, Forfa in pole position at the minute, and and I think that home advantage is is going to prove all the. I think that will prove essential. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ruffy, would you have gone for that? Are you uh, going to go for that? Uh, trip no, I, I wouldn't bet against Dick. You know, he's got a, a, a fantastic uh, record there. Uh, I think it's five. He might he might correct me if I'm wrong here, but he's yeah. taking the teams up from uh, small lower divisions. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're uh, you've gone. You've gone. <laughs> You really need to go and see somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you really do. So, are you going for a broth? Or yes, I'm going for a broth. A broth, OK. That's fine. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that, Ruffy. Um, next week, we'll have Frankie Howard on the show. Um, <laughs> let's cut to the chase of some other stories then. Um, so, you say Forfar. You're broth. saying our broth. I, I, I'm going to go <coughs> I, I'm going to go with Forfar. I'm going to stick with your knowledge on that as well. Um, now, Scotland. Under 17s earlier today, 2 0. Um, I think good start for Scott Gemmell's side. Um, Kelly's um, in his Cameron and Celtic's Jack Aitchison getting the goals. Jack Aitchison's had a great couple of weeks, hasn't he? I mean, he's scored yeah. in the Glasgow Cup final, the winning goal, and, and he's helped Scotland get off to a really good start. Yeah, I think we all know how important it is <coughs> for the kids to do well in these tournaments. Uh, it just gets the more experience you get, the better you get. But I think Scott is trying to get us into, I think it's the top eight. They get automatic into the, the world uh, next next year. So the experience that they'll get here, uh, obviously they've got a big game coming up against France. It's, uh, but I, I think it's always good to start the tournament with a win. It doesn't matter who you're playing. You've got points in the bag and it gives you confidence going into the next one. Yeah, the general consensus from everyone we've had on the programme, footballers, managers, you name it, uh, it's all right, you know, doing well, making major tournaments, which we'd love to see. Everybody's so focused on it now at under-17s. Uh, in fact, at any of the under-levels, we want to see... Uh, Scotland do well, but it's making that jump, Craig. Did, did you play with some people that you thought really special and were able <clears> to make the jump? Is there a psychology or something that happens that you've noticed about why some special players just fall at the final hurdle and can't make the jump to the first team? Um, you know, it's mentally, it's tough. Uh, there's a lot of sacrifices to be made. Um, you know, 
the potential of do you think you've made it before you actually have made it? Yeah. Uh, it, it it's a crucial age, 16, 17, when you start to, you know, you, you get the tag of being a professional football player and, and if that goes into your head before you've actually achieved anything, then that's when a lot of kids fall by the wayside. But this, this tournament that they're playing in, you know, there's eyes all over the world watching it. When I was 16, we played against France and Sanama, Flon Sanama Pongoli and Anthony Letalic played and they played, they, they absolutely ripped us apart and they actually moved to Liverpool for huge money after it. So it's a massive off opportunity for these young kids if they're prepared to, to sacrifice their, their lives to the game, they can, they can really go to the top. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the key to it now. I think the, the mentality, it needs to change. And I think Malky Mackay has emphasised it. Brendan Rodgers certainly has emphasised it to the players, you know, with regards to body fat, with regards to fitness, with regards to work rate when you don't have the ball and when you have the ball. Yeah, absolutely. These things are all vital. <coughs> you know, what a bugbear of mine is when you're going through social media and, and you see all these kids and you know they've pictures in their strips and stuff and, and because they've, they've played a game they, they think they've made it, they think they're yeah. superstars because they've got a couple of thousand followers on Twitter. There's, this is today's day and age but there's so much more to it. There's so much sacrifice to be made if, if you actually want to get anywhere in life and it's, you know, believe me, it's, it's a long hard road. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't imagine you suffered from a, a lack of confidence when you were younger, did you? Do you know what? No, I, I, know, I know you're taking the mickey here, right? No, no, I'm genuine. I'm genuinely looking no. I, I remember you as a boy and I didn't sense that there was that lack of confidence in you. No, there, there, there certainly wasn't, but um, there was more in a belief and that was down to, as I say, the sacrifices that I'd made and the hard work that I was putting in. And, you know, when I was playing in, in Celtic's youth team, there was, you know, Spurs were up watching me and they, they had bid half a million pounds for me as, as an 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, sorry, that, that had never played in the first team. Yeah. So I was taking confidence from that and um, the fact that I was going and training with the first team and that I was competing and, you know, it just gave me that self-belief and, and that confidence without being arrogant because, yeah. you know, I've never been arrogant. I've always been pleasant but hard-working and, and self-assured and um, getting the balance is, is difficult but... Uh, it, listen, you've got to figure it out or you, yeah. you fall by the wayside. You'll be able to tell when I'm taking the mic. There's a cold stare that goes towards <laughs> you. <laughs> listen, we'll rejoin <laughs> Craig, BT and uh, Ruffy after this quick break. Uh, I wonder if you know the answer to this question. Just absolutely incredible. 47 hat-tricks. And number 47 delivered mm -hmm. against Atletico Madrid last night in the Champions League semi-final first leg. As I was watching the match, I mean, he's scoring them with a the head, he's in there with the, with the feet as well, Ruffy. I mean, he's just, he's a sensation. I mean, we're lucky to have two of the world's yeah. greatest players playing, going tit for tat with each other. Yeah, uh, and I, I think uh, the two of them are wonderful, but I think the only difference between the two of them now is he seems to be doing it at the big the big stage. He seems to be doing it at the World Cup, he's doing it in the Champions League, he's winning games single-handedly. I know Messi does it as well, but uh, last night again, you know, when we talk about somebody with self-belief in themselves or arrogance or whatever you call it, he's got it in abundance and obviously he works hard at it. Uh, I have to say, I thought the first goal was offside, but uh, it's by the by. <laughs> but uh, no, it just I mean, it came out of the lack of their team. You know, can you imagine, you know, and we say it on numerous occasions when you come to big games, whether it's finals, World Cup finals, European Cup finals, whatever final, and you look about the dressing room and you wait, who's going to be our match one other day? If you're sitting in that Real Madrid dressing room, you know you've got somebody who can step up. Uh, it doesn't matter where it is or when it is. He's the man. Yeah, well, if he's um, guilty of being arrogant, he can back it up with the stats.
I've got a sneaky feeling he'll have his fourth Champions League winner's medal. And of course, Craig, this is a guy who started out effectively as a number seven. He's now become a number nine. Yeah, he's uh, he's an absolute phenomenon. Um, do you know what? He strikes me as a player that could play anywhere. I think if, if he had to, he could actually drop into midfield and, and play a deeper role as well. Just goals, pace, power. He's just so direct, so focused. And I think the, the fact that he's got so good, I think a, a credit's got to go to Lionel Messi as well and vice versa. I think the, the two of them come along at the same time and they've pushed for years and years competing. And I think they've actually pushed each other on to be better than, than one another. Um, absolute phenomenons, the, the two of them. And I think we've got to, rather than compare them and trying to get who's the best, just appreciate it. Because when these guys are gone in the next couple of years, I, I think we'll struggle to see anything like this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's amazing that the two of them are able to mm -hmm. continually score these goals. I mean, I think it's the third season coming up. Uh, when it gets to the end of La Liga, that the the trio of Neymar, Suarez, and, and Messi have hit a hundred goals. Uh, I mean, they're relentless as well. But Messi, in particular, mm -hmm. if one breaks a record, the next one achieves it and surpasses it. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. People have their favourites. I, I think on our programme, people have their favourites. Some don't like him because he can be a, a little bit theatrical, and let uh, and Lionel Messi is less so. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you were to totally press me, I'm still in the Messi camp. Uh, but again, you know, Ronaldo uh, isn't letting anybody down. I think when they, they took Gareth Bale there, you know, everybody thought Gareth Bale was going to move to a Ronaldo level. Although he has moved to another level, I don't think he's near Ronaldo yet. And for the two of them to be in a particular side uh, is just awesome. You know, and you can see... You know, when they play, you imagine getting out to play against them and you know as soon as the team lines comes in and he's in that, you know, you're not, you, you know he's going to score at some time, you know, and, and then that puts you on the back foot right away. Yeah, uh, incredible stats and uh, some incredible goals. Is there any way back for Atletico in this one? No, I wouldn't think so. Um, they're, they're a team that traditionally don't score a lot of goals. Um, the foundations of the team are based on a, a sort of a tight defence, um, which obviously wasn't that tight last night. And I, I Nah, they, they won't turn it around to no chance. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I'd, I said they are pretty poor on side, but they, they've got wonderful players on their side, obviously, Griezmann. But uh, I can't see them scoring three goals. Can I ask you this question, Rafi? I know you've uh, changed your team. <laughs> might, as well, might, as well, might as well get your thoughts. I mean, uh, if, if Ronaldo and Real Madrid are heading for, I think this would be their 12th Champions League trophy um, or European Cup, depending on your age group, um, can you see Monaco or Juventus, either one of those two, stopping them? I think in a, in a, in a European <coughs> final, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, it doesn't matter who's better than the others. On the night, you know, we saw it doesn't matter what cup final, you're on the night, things can happen. On the night, big players can do something special. It uh, doesn't matter which of these two teams get in the final, they've got players in, you know, that can win games. I, I personally hope Juve get into the final, basically from a goalkeeping point of view, because I think Buffon. Uh, with the career that he's had and the age that he's at, I, I would love to see him winning it. I'm glad you mentioned the age because um, you, you actually, I think you chucked it in your late 30s, roughly, were you 39? 39, yeah. Yeah, and uh, there's one player that I think deserves a special mention is Francesco Totti. Um, he is going to retire at the end of the season. Finally, he, he decides to hang up the boots. He's been a hero for Roma. Um, over 600 appearances for the club, 40 years of age to do it at that level for such a long time. Remarkable. Um, a player that I've had the pleasure of playing against as well. Uh, played against him in a pre-season friendly in America one year. Um, come out the tunnel with the, the shaved hand legs and the tiny shin pads on with the, shot, the socks down, just oozing class, oozing confidence and you know, a fantastic player. And to have served that, that long at the one club, he's, just, he's got God status at, at Roma. And, yeah. and rightly so. Were you in any way jealous when you when you saw him and he, he looked that good and he um, could play? Incredible footballer, you know, awesome hair, handsome. Yeah, yeah, it was, okay. yeah. <laughs> I, I can accept that from you, Craig. Um, just out of curiosity, I might as well let people know who you know. You played against some good players. I mean, we were gobsmacked the first time you told us about <laughs> medals you'd won. Mm -hmm. um, no, no disrespect to your career, I mean, but uh, some of the best players in the world you've played against. Get, rhyme a few off for us because I always like to always like to share this thing with people. Right. Okay. Yeah, do, you want, do you want the team? <laughs> yeah. Give me your give right, me your okay, dream give you team. The, the four best. Uh, 
defenders that I've played against. Well, sorry, I won't miss out the goalkeeper, mm -hmm. um, Peter Cech. So, phenomenal recent years. Four best defenders will go Carlos Puyol, Cannavaro, Nesta and Maldini. Midfield will go Totti, Kaka and Pirlo. And three forwards will go Samuel Eto'o, Arjen Robin and Ronaldinho when he was World Player of the Year. Yeah, yeah. you got to be happy with that, Ruffy. Are you happy uh, with I'm that? I'm shocked. They are both boys, isn't it? Yeah, man, <laughs> really, it's a good point. <laughs> I'm amazed. I've had some rows that I've enjoyed this year. Yeah, really. absolutely. Uh, I must admit, <laughs> I must admit, I'd, uh, I'd never get tired of uh, punching you if you just kept mentioning <laughs> that in the dressing room. <laughs> but, but, but listen, it's great that you actually achieved it and you got there and you played it. Um, just before we finish, a couple of little points that I want to get your thoughts on, uh, guys. Um, Tommy Wright, mentioning him in line for the Northern Ireland job, should Michael O'Neill get the Norwich City job? job at the managerial merry-go-round, Ruffy? Yeah, again, it'll be his decision. You know, it depends on, you know, being the national uh, team manager, where that fits into the day-to-day -day running of a football team, and he'll be the one that makes it. He might think he's at the age where uh, he'd want to be the national manager. Uh, and one point which I think is a sad note to end on is Aaron Lennon. Um, at this moment, uh, he's been uh, obviously... Uh, kept under close watch uh, under the Mental Health Act. I, I think it's a tragedy and I, I do hope, um, you know, he gets, he gets help. This is something that I think people think footballers live a glamorous life. We're all human beings. We all suffer from the same kind of faults through life. Yeah, absolutely. It, it just shows you that we are all human. We make mistakes. There's, there's issues that happen. Um, you know, he's, he's a wealthy young man with the world at his feet, but it just shows you how powerful this subject is. And, you know, you go into a football changing room and there's this macho image, there's, you know, mental illness is, is a taboo, it's, it's a don't talk about it, but, you know, with, with the opportunity here and the line of work that I'm in now, it's also something that's, that's, that's close to me and I would encourage anybody that's suffering from any mental illness to, to seek help because there's help out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. It's, it's the perfect way to finish, I think, everyone in the football show. Thoughts with Aaron for a, a, a full recovery or at least help in a, a recovery as well. Uh, great to have Craig Beattie on the programme. We'll go back over that dream team of his and just dissect it. Uh, Ruffy and me are raging, by the way, raging. <laughs>